But I, I want to start by thanking Kent for supporting this event, Emmanuel and Steve for all you've done to put this together. I really am grateful. And it's such an honor to be here in Silicon Valley. I want to kick things off by showing a quick video. Daddy is the sweetest daddy in the world. Daddy is the most handsome. The smartest. The most clever. The kindest. He is my Superman. Daddy wants me to do well at school. Daddy is just great, but... He lies. He lies about having a job. He lies about having money. He lies that he is not tired. He lies that he is not hungry. He lies that we have everything. He lies about his happiness. He lies because of me. So that video moves me every time I watch it. It moves me because I'm a father. It moves me because I have a little girl that means the world to me. But mostly it moves me because I've met that man. And I've met him many times. I've represented him in countless cases. Our prisons and jails in America are filled with men just like him. Fathers who love their children men who are looking for work but can't find it, who will do any odd job to make ends meet. But at some point, they just can't find that next odd job. And then they're faced with a question. Do I let my baby girl go hungry or do I do something drastic? And I think to myself, if I were faced with that situation, would I do something drastic? Would I maybe steal a sandwich? I know for me, the answer is yes. And if that man does that, and he's caught, he will be arrested, he will be processed into a court system, and he'll be given a label. In courtrooms across this country, he'll be labeled a thief. And without an advocate, without a lawyer, to provide a counter narrative, to show him as a father, as a caring person, as a hard worker, he will be processed into a cell 
with no thought about his daughter. We won't know if perhaps she drops out of school, perhaps ends up in an orphanage, winds up in the juvenile justice system. We won't know because we won't know the counter story. What I've learned in my over 20 years now working in the criminal justice system is that if anything defines criminal justice in America, it's that we are indifferent to most people process through the system every day. I started my career in Washington, D.C. I was fortunate to be in a well-resourced public defender office for 10 years. I had the resources and I had manageable caseloads to give every client what they deserved. I worked seven days a week, but in working that hard, I could give people what they deserved. And I came to think after 10 years that that is generally how justice worked in America. And then I moved to the South to help with an effort to build a new criminal justice system in Georgia. And I started to meet these young, passionate public defenders. They were every bit as talented as the lawyers I knew in DC, but they went into systems that had come to accept an embarrassingly low standard of justice for poor people. They went into systems that expected them to go along with the processing. And after a while, many of them either quit or became resigned to the status quo. Perhaps most emblematic of that was when two years after being in Georgia, I left to spend a year helping rebuild the public defender office in New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And I remember when I went to New Orleans, I walked into a courtroom for the first time. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. There were people everywhere in suits. There were, there, there were men and women in suits scattered across the courtroom. You didn't know who the defenders were. You didn't know who the prosecutors were because no one was tethered to a particular table. You knew who the judge was because he was on the bench with a robe and you knew who the accused were because they were men in orange jumpsuits lined up and shackled. And the judge started calling cases and the judge would call a name and a voice would float up from the suit. She didn't know what suit the voice belonged to. No one in a suit ever stood next to someone in an orange jumper. And a voice would float up and within 10 or 15 seconds they'd move on to the next case and the processing just went on until eventually the judge called a name and there was no voice. And the judge turned to the orange jumpsuits and said, is Mr. So-and-so here? And a man stood up and the judge said, where's your lawyer? And the man said, I haven't seen my lawyer since I got locked up. And the judge said, well, how long have you been locked up? The man said, 70 days. Judge said, thank you, sir, sit down and went on with the processing. And what shocked me more than the fact that a man was locked up for 70 days without a lawyer was that no one in that courtroom was phased. Not the judge, not the prosecutors, not the defenders who were charged with being the voice of these men. It was my introduction to something that really forms the basis of Gideon's promise, and that is that the greatest problem we have in the criminal justice system is a cultural problem. We have come to accept the processing of poor people as normal. This painting by a man named Frank Wu simply captioned indifference. It's really a quite, quite a moving painting to me. It, it, it's, its message is so simple, right? It's these robotic legs walking past this homeless veteran curled up in a fetal position. And the message is that all of us are bombarded every day by so much misery, so much poverty, so much injustice, that it just becomes human nature to walk by it. We build up a wall around us as a defense mechanism, not because we're bad people, but because it's human nature. My kids are two of the biggest homeless advocates you'd ever meet. My son, who's eight, said to me not long ago, he said, Daddy, when you grow up, I love that, when you grow up, he thinks I'm young. He said, when you grow up, if you could be anyone in the world, who would you be other than me or, or my sister, Aaliyah, or mommy? I said, well, I don't know, Lucas, who would you be? He said, well, I'd either be Antonio Brown, his favorite football player, or a homeless person. I said, a homeless person, why? He said, well, because then I would know what it feels like and I could grow up to do something about it. His sister, my daughter Alia, who's 12, she's been a homeless advocate since she was a child. Ever since she was five or six years old, she'd break open her piggy bank in the morning and put change in a baggie to give to the homeless man who, who, who's on the off-ramp on the way to school. And one day we were walking down the street and a man said to me, sir, can you spare a dollar? 
And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't help you. And we kept on walking and I felt this tug on my sleeve and I looked down and it was my daughter. And she said, Daddy. And I said, yeah, baby. She said, Daddy, doesn't that man need a dollar more than you? And I thought to myself, of course he does. And then I thought to myself, where did she learn that? Right? She learned it from me and she learned it from her mother, Illy, and she, she learned these things from her parents, but it was a reminder to me that all of us, all of us, if we don't guard against indifference, can, can forget the values we hold dearest, the values we teach our own children. It's a lesson that I understand not only about my children, it's a lesson about life, it's a lesson about the work we do in the criminal justice system. The nation was awakened a little over two and a half years ago to a cruel reality that equal justice in America doesn't really exist. We were awakened to it when the news of the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri took to social media. And then from there, news of Eric Garner's death, being choked to death in, in New York. 12-year-old Tamir Rice being shot in Cleveland, Ohio. Sandra Bland dying down in Texas. Freddie Gray in Baltimore. We've been awakened to the fact that some communities simply aren't seen as human. Some communities are treated much more brutally in America. And I think we come to believe that's a problem about abusive policing, and it is. But we have to remember that for every person shot and killed by a police officer in America, Tens of thousands are arrested. They are thrown into a criminal justice system. They are processed into cells. Frequently, with a heroic public defender, but a public defender who is overwhelmed, beaten down, and under-resourced. It's root that routine injustice, that injustice that flies under the radar, that is crippling poor communities across America. It's that routine injustice that public defenders deal with every day. Last September, a man named Keith Lamont Scott was shot and killed in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm sure you all heard about it because the protests were broadcast across the nation. And while those protests were going on, a nine-year-old girl, Zayana Oliphant, testified before the Charlotte City Council. She talked about how she knew at the age of nine that her community wasn't respected. She said, we are black people and we deserve to be treated with rights. It broke my heart to see a nine-year-old girl who understood at such a tender age that she came from a community that didn't matter. Certainly not as much as other communities. It made me think of Illy's story, because when Illy and I co-founded Gideon's Promise, I came at it from the perspective of a lawyer who saw lawyers as a critical vehicle to ensuring that justice is done. Illy wasn't a lawyer, she was a school teacher. She got involved in this work because as a child, she was like young Zayana Oliphant. She had experiences that made her realize her community didn't matter. At the age of five, her father went to prison after being accused of a crime that he had committed years earlier. Years before he married her mother, years before he opened up a fish market, years before he had three children with a fourth on the way, he was given a court-appointed lawyer that never told his story. And without his story being told, it was easy to usher him into a prison cell. Illy's youngest sibling, her brother, himself now has grown up to be incarcerated, despite the fact that he went to Cornell and she helped raise him and brought him to college. She couldn't help him avoid the criminal justice system and he's locked up now. Every man in her life has been in the criminal justice system. Children across America like Illy, like Zayana Oliphant understand that the injustice isn't just flowing from police killings. They learn it through our criminal justice system. They learn it when they see the people they love funneled through courtrooms. Every day they watch fathers and mothers and uncles processed. They learn it when they have to speak to their loved ones through thick glass on telephones. 
They know that their loved ones are warehoused in intolerable conditions. And if they ever get out, Many of them won't be able to return to their homes or their jobs. They won't be able to vote or get educational loans. Many of them will be rendered homeless. If they happen to not be citizens, they may be pried from their families and sent away, perhaps never to see their children again. The criminal justice system is wreaking havoc on our most marginalized communities. It is, I would argue, the greatest challenge we face today as Americans. In America, we have 2.3 million people locked up in prison, 7 million people under some form of control in the criminal justice system at any given time. People are warehoused in cells that none of us would want to spend a day in. And yet, where's the outrage? We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as human beings. In Arizona, up until recently, Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio was the leading voice of the criminal justice system there. He recently got voted out of office, but he was elected popularly six times on a tough on crime platform. He built tent cities in the sweltering desert heat tent cities to house pre-trial detainees who weren't even convicted of crimes. He forced them to wear pink underwear because in his mind that somehow was an effort to shred them of every shred of humanity that they, that they had. And here in California in 2012, inmates across the state went on a hunger strike. Some wouldn't eat for up to 60 days. They were literally saying, I'd rather be dead than housed in these conditions. We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as human beings. Some of you may have watched the story on TV of Khalif Browder, a 16-year-old boy who was accused of stealing a backpack in New York City. He went to Rikers Island, the detention center in New York, and he was given a bond that his family couldn't afford to pay, so he stayed there for three years maintaining his innocence. He spent roughly two and a half of those years in solitary confinement. He endured beatings at the hands of guards and inmates. And then after three years when the state couldn't produce the evidence to bring him to trial, his case was dismissed, but the damage was done. Khalif Browder went home. Two years later, his mother found him after he hung himself. Where were all of the men and women responsible for overseeing justice in America while this was happening to Khalif Browder? They couldn't have stood by if they truly saw him as a human being. Myra Machado was 31 years old when she was deported back to El Salvador. She moved here when she was five years old. She didn't know life anywhere but America. As a teenager, she made a stupid mistake and passed some bad checks. She spent some time in a boot camp, and more than a decade later, she was living her life with three children when she was pulled over and based on her prior conviction, held in a detention facility for over a year. Just this year, she was deported back to El Salvador. Her children lost their mother. We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as human beings. The damage that was done to Ms. Machado's family started when she went into a criminal justice system. Advocates who understand the consequences of going through the system, who speak up for individuals, who make decisions that will protect them not only while they're going through the criminal justice system but beyond are the key to saving lives like Ms. Machado's. But we simply don't have the will to make sure those advocates are supported. There's an African proverb that says, until the lion learns to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. There are communities across America who are preyed upon. Their humanity is 
defined by others because they're not given the voice to help shape their own stories. They're not given the voice because the public defenders who are responsible for speaking for 80% of the people in the criminal justice system have been beaten down and overwhelmed. In 1963, this man, Clarence Earl Gideon, his case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court used that case to say that lawyers are the vehicle necessary to ensure that justice is done in the courts, that we can't have justice without lawyers, that our system of laws and procedure are just too complicated for a layperson to maneuver alone. We see Gideon versus Wainwright narrowly as a case about providing counsel to individuals when they're in trouble, but I would suggest to you that looking at that case that way is too narrow. We have to understand Gideon versus Wainwright in the context of the times. It was decided in 1963. The same year as the March on Washington. The same year as many civil rights milestones. The same year that as a nation we were grappling with the fact that we were depriving basic civil and human rights to huge populations of people in all walks of life, in education, in commerce, in transportation, in voting rights, and not least among them in the criminal justice system. Gideon versus Wainwright is a civil rights case. It belongs on that menu of legislation and Supreme Court cases that define our civil rights landscape. And when seen that way, the lawyers who represent people in the criminal justice system are doing our most important civil rights work. As I mentioned, more than 80% of the people in the criminal justice system are poor. Disproportionately, they are people of color. The criminal justice system is rendering them second-class citizens. There is no greater civil rights crisis facing us. Five years after that march on Washington, the Memphis sanitation workers took to the streets with signs saying, I am a man, a very simple message, recognizing we're simply not being treated as human beings. Treat us as human beings. And we like to think that we've overcome that. But aren't activists in the streets today carrying signs simply saying Black Lives Matter? Aren't they saying the same thing? Aren't they saying we still aren't truly seen as full human beings? Hands reach out in our criminal justice system desperately needing help. And the public defender is the advocate responsible for giving them that help. But all across the country, our public defenders are overwhelmed. This picture of a public defender surrounded by files shows how overwhelmed so many public defenders are. But keep in mind, every one of those files is a human being. Every one of those files is a person who won't get the care, the attention, the protection we would all expect for our loved ones. I was thinking about this when I was watching a video of a man who was one of the leaders of the indigent defense community in Tennessee. He was the public defender who was elected by all of the other Tennessee public defenders to speak for them. He was the president of the public defender conference in Tennessee. And he was at a budget hearing. And he was asked a very simple question. Do you have enough resources? He said, well, let me tell you, I, I oversee a district with five counties. I have five courthouses. He said, I have five lawyers. I have one investigator. Last year, we closed 4,000 cases. That's 800 cases per lawyer. And he went on to say, so let me assure you, there is one district in Tennessee that has enough. We're blessed. I have senior lawyers. They're efficient. They are good at processing cases. That's the language he used to describe the work of his staff. And I think to myself when I watch that video, there's no doubt in my mind that man didn't come out of law school 30 years ago saying, you know what I want to do with my life? I think I want to help process 800 people a year into prison cells. He was shaped over time into a lawyer 
that he never would have recognized as a law student. Not because he's a bad person, but because he is a product of a system that simply doesn't really care about equal justice. And so that brings me to Gideon's promise. That was the challenge that Illy and I were, were, were thinking about when we started this organization. And it is an organization designed not just to train lawyers on the law, not just to give them legal skills, but to build a community to help them resist those pressures to abandon the values that made them want to do this work in the first place. It's a community that gives them strategies to resist those pressures today and to be advocates to challenge the assumptions that others in the, in the system have that lead to the injustice. At the heart of our program is a three-year program for new lawyers that we call our Core 101 program. For three years, new lawyers go through a, a program where they receive training and mentorship and support. It starts with a two-week boot camp where they come together to learn and to community build and to build support. And then they go back to their offices and they're given mentors. And we have an online community and they support one another. But we also recognized, as our first classes started to graduate, that if we didn't continue to support them, the cultures they returned to would soon shape them. And so we developed a graduate program. And the graduate program was designed to, to groom them into the, into the trainers and the mentors that the younger, younger lawyers desperately needed. We developed a leadership program so we could bring the heads of their offices, the chief defenders, together every six months to think about how to support these lawyers. We developed a trainer development program so we could get trainers and supervisors to learn the, the, the curriculum and support what we were teaching back in the office. And we developed a law clerk program so we could bring br the brightest law students from around the country to Mississippi and Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee to support these young lawyers. But all of those programs weren't only designed to support these young lawyers who were the future of criminal justice reform. They were also designed to transform the existing system. The graduate program also has an external component where we're grooming those graduates into tomorrow's leaders. The law clerk program. Not only are they coming to support our lawyers during the summer, but they're starting to build avenues, channels, so they can come to the public defender offices with the greatest need. They can become part of this movement that we're building. The leaders aren't only learning how to support their lawyers in the office and change the culture in the office, but they're learning how to advocate for reform in the communities where they work. And in our trainer development program, we're not just teaching trainers to support our lawyers in our program, but they're learning how to export this model and to take it back to systems across the country. <coughs> when you look at all of the offices we've touched, we have literally had a hand in helping shape indigent defense in 27 states across America. There's no question with the human resources we are developing through our programming that we could scale this model. We have scaled this model from two states to 27. The only limit to how far we can go is resources, but it's also important to understand that not only are we trying to scale, not only are we trying to grow our reach, it is critical that we also focus on depth. Because to change culture, you can't just touch a lawyer and send them back to a state, you've got to hold on to them. You can't touch them, you have to embrace them, you have to wrap your arms around them, you have to support them as they develop into leaders that you desperately need. So not only have we touched offices across 27 states, we actually have partnerships where we have sustained relationships with over 40 county level offices across 16 states. We have a statewide partnership in Maryland. We have literally worked with every public defender in the state of Maryland. And we're in the process of forging statewide partnerships in Virginia and in Michigan. The impact has been tremendous. 
And we know that the impact has been tremendous from several sources. We know the impact has been tremendous from our own lawyers' experiences. For example, there's a young woman in Georgia named Janelle. Janelle was one of our earliest lawyers in one of our earliest classes. And she came to Georgia because, as she says, I wanted to represent people that looked like me. Janelle grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in an African-American community. She went to Spelman College and Howard Law School, both HBCUs. She became a public defender because she wanted to represent people of color. And she joined our program and she ended up getting placed in Bartow County, Georgia, which is about 45 minutes outside of Atlanta, but it may as well be hours away. Almost all of her clients were white. She was the only African-American woman attorney in the county. She talks about how she would walk into the courtroom with her briefcase in her suit and how long it took before the bailiff stopped, stopped asking her where her lawyer was. And one day Janelle called me up because she was trying to grapple with a particular problem. She had a juvenile client who was going to be sentenced and she had a statute, and she was convinced that this statute made clear that the judge couldn't detain this young man. But she said she'd been talking to senior lawyers in the county, and they said that that argument would never work. They said, don't even bring it up. The judge will laugh at you. And she called to say, what do you think? And she talked to me and several other of our mentors, and we all came to the same conclusion. Of course you have to bring it up. The statute is clear, and she steeled herself, and she walked into the courtroom, and she stood up. And she made the argument. As she made the argument, she heard snickers in the background from some of the more seasoned lawyers. And then the judge granted her motion. And the snickering stopped. But not only did Janelle disrupt a system of injustice when she did that, she began transforming that system of justice. You see, some of those lawyers who are laughing in the audience now file that very motion. How else do we know we have impact? We recently worked with an organization called Measures for Justice under a grant from the Department of Justice to look at the outcomes that our lawyers receive. And the initial findings seem quite positive. Measures for Justice looked at three of our partner offices in Tennessee, Memphis, Knoxville, and Nashville, and compared it to a, a, uh, a, a, a test office in Chattanooga. And what the preliminary findings suggest is that our lawyers, their clients are more likely to get pretrial diversion. They're less likely to plead guilty. They've closed more cases quickly, meaning people aren't languishing in jail that their clients are incarcerated less often. Those outputs matter. We also know because the leaders who partner with us tell us so. As a matter of fact, I get these emails all the time. Illy gets these emails all the time. Just last week, I, I share this one with you because it's literally the most recent. I got an email from Fielding Pringle. She's the chief public defender in Columbia, South Carolina. They joined our partnership about three years ago. She wrote to tell me that before they joined Gideon's Promise, they would lose somewhere between five to nine lawyers a year in an office that only had 25 to 30 lawyers. But she said, since we joined Gideon's Promise, in 2014, we lost two lawyers. In 2015, we only lost two lawyers. In 2016, only one lawyer left our office. And she went on to say the impact of retention on the quality of representation continuity of representation, morale, organizational structure, and overall smooth running of my office has improved dramatically as a result. I attribute these, this change to better hiring practices, but also and largely to the culture shift that the Gideon's Promise attorneys have brought to our office and our community. She said they're a different kind of public defender and they infuse the attorneys around them with their spirit, their confidence, their commitment, their excitement, and their drive, they are a changing force. This matters. And so this picture, and then I'm gonna wrap up with the last story, this picture is a picture of 
Some of our lawyers at our last gathering, we get together every six months and bring all of our lawyers together. And a couple years ago, as the lawyers leave each other, some go back to pretty remote places with little support. And a couple years ago, one of the lawyers suggested we should end our meetings with a group hug. And he stood up and he got in the middle and he encouraged everyone to come in and he brought in one lawyer who was, partic who was feeling particularly lonely and brought her in the middle and he hugged her and everyone hugged around her and it became a tradition because what these lawyers really understand is the love and support they feel when they get together that has to be sustained. They have to feel that when they go back to their jurisdictions, they have to feel that when they're at their lowest moment because this battle is too important and their work is too important. If they are to stand next to clients and give them voice, if they are to infuse the system with humanity, they know they can't do it alone. And so this is my final story and then I'm gonna wrap up. But Every year, Illy and I get phone calls. All of our mentors get phone calls because we have young lawyers that come down to Oxford, Mississippi, and they spend two weeks in the initial two-week program, and they get fired up, and they think they can change the world, and they feel like they've got all the support in the world, and they go back to their offices. And then they start to feel defeated. And within a couple of weeks, the phone starts ringing. And the calls all go something like this. They'll call and they'll say, hey, rap. Everyone calls me rap. Hey, rap, I think I need to quit. I feel defeated. I've got 300 cases. I now know what every client deserves, but I just simply can't give it to them. And I share with them a story from a book I read called Freedom Summer, written by a man named Bruce Watson, where he tells the story of that amazing summer project in 1964, where young people, college students from around the country, came to Mississippi to register people to vote, to build freedom schools, to help people pass literacy tests. And Bruce Watson tells his story through the eyes of people who were there, now after interviewing them 40 years later. And you learn through, these, through this book that these young folks, they went down to Mississippi thinking they could change the world, and one after the other, they started to find doors being slammed in their faces. They started to, to have people tell them, I can't be seen talking to you. My life could be in danger. They started to get discouraged. As the summer went on, they said things like, maybe this was a mistake. Maybe my family was right. Maybe none of this matters. And Bruce Watson fast forwards 40 years to a conversation with Congressman John Lewis, who was one of the architects of Freedom Summer. And Congressman Lewis says, you know, if it weren't for Freedom Summer, Barack Obama wouldn't be in the White House. Quite literally, he was saying that sometimes change is so incremental that those most involved in it don't even recognize they're doing it. And we share that story with our lawyers, and we say to our lawyers, when you walk into a courtroom and you see a judge who simply wants you to sit down and shut up, who simply wants you to go along with the processing, and you stand up and you say, Judge, I'm not doing it today. When you refuse to participate, you may not get the tangible result that your client wants or even deserves, but when you do that, and your colleagues are doing that in a courtroom next door, and another group are doing it in the next county over, and another group in the next state over, collectively you are raising expectations about what justice should look like for poor people. Collectively, you're not just disrupting, you are transforming criminal justice collectively you are changing and challenging the assumptions of the people who make decisions about those most impacted by our criminal justice system. So I will end by saying my guess is many of you heard my friend Brian Stevenson give a, a talk here. And one thing Brian talks about is proximity. And I want to just emphasize that proximity is more than just getting spatially close to another person. Our courtrooms are filled with judges and prosecutors and probation officers who are spatially close 
to people they are processing into cells for intolerable amounts of time. Proximity is more than just standing near someone. It's getting to know someone. It's getting to understand who they are. It's getting to understand what they want out of life. It's learning the skills to tell their story. It is making other people not just get near those impacted by their decisions, but truly understand those impacted by their decisions. In our criminal justice system, we quite literally can't do that without public defenders. They are the vehicle that forces us, us to get proximate to people whose lives are otherwise being thrown away. And so I want to end by saying thank you so much for having me and Illy here in the Silicon Valley. It's an honor to be here because you all really are dealing with some of the, the world's most intractable problems. You have some of the most creative minds. You're coming up with some of the most amazing solutions. Technology can solve a lot of problems, as Steve said. But it's critical that we remember, as we think about how to use technology to solve problems, we don't lose sight of the humanity of the people impacted and it takes boots on the ground, married with the brilliance of places like Google to make sure equal justice is a reality. Thank you.